Hello everyone. Thank you for just watching me testing uh, the mute that was working, since you could not hear anything. So today's webinar is about talk from 10 techniques for out systems. My name is Ruben Gonçalves, and I'm the head of mobile and front end experts at out systems. As I was trying to say you before, uh, I would like to start this webinar with a disclaimer. This is a rather extensive subject, uh, so you should expect some simplifications and also some homework. And there is no better way to start a webinar than with a story. So once upon a time, there was a dragon. And the name of the dragon was, you cannot do this in our systems. And this dragon was terrible, and every developer was afraid of it. And every time that we, you would start a project and the project would look like a normal or a very um, interesting website, the developer would be afraid that the dragon would attack and would make them not able to deliver the project. So in order to fight this dragon, I've actually put it together an agenda. So our agenda for today is, first of all, what's under the hood? So how does the platform work? What is the platform doing under the hood enabling us to do our projects and our code? So what makes it run? Then we'll move to some of the top front-end techniques that we will be applying to our systems. Namely, we'll be start by seeing some of the best practices that we should apply. We will also rediscover what is the personal area and how it actually helps us. We will understand and learn how we can change the head before the page is actually sent to the, to the end user. And we will also understand the importance of browser support and also browser testing and how we can actually make this simpler. Then we will start by cutting corners and try to become more, uh, to become faster delivering our CSS and our front end code. And we'll see how. And one of the ways will actually be to avoid one click publish. Finally, we will actually fight the dragon. And by fighting the dragon, I mean, we will see some examples of applications built with the platform that have great UI. Moving forward to the first chapter, so what's under the hood, or it could be named also Out Systems Front End 101. As you probably already know, in Out Systems you are working with Service Studio, which is the IDE. The, when we are actually working on Service Studio, Service Studio is under the hood, is creating an XML file called the OML, Out Systems Module Language. When we actually click Publish, this module is sent to the server where the code will be generated, both the code for the database, but also for the logic and the UI. And then it will run in different kinds of servers. And in this example would be in the Microsoft server. What is actually sent to the, to the client is HTML. And this is a typical HTML page. We will actually analyze the HTML of this page as it is. So starting with the head, we can see that we have three different areas. We have some HTML, some CSS, and some JavaScript. With HTML, I mean actually meta tags. So this meta tags will be responsible for, will be working for the responsive and for enabling our application to be web mobile app. So imagine to enable our users to add our responsive app to their home screen in iOS. Moving forward to the CSS, we will see that actually there are different types of files. So we have CSS that is created and injected by the Out Systems platform, which is these two. We have our the CSS that we create and that we add to the web logs. We have then the team, and finally we have the CSS present on the page if we have some. There are several places, as we can see, 
where we can add CSS. We can add on the theme. We can add, and this means that when we are adding on the theme, it means that in every page uh, that is using that theme and using a page using the theme, it means that the module to where the page is um, located uh, is using that theme. For example, has a default theme and that the flow where the page is inserted in is using the default uh, eSpace theme or is using directly the theme that we are making. Then we can also add CSS in the page. And this means that C this CSS will be only used in this specific page. And finally, we can also add CSS in the web block. And this means that every page that is using the web block will import that CSS. So the order in, in which the platform adds the, the links to these files in the head is the first one is the web block, followed by the theme, and the last file to be added is the page. The reason for this is when we are creating web blocks, the idea is that they can be used across multiple applications, meaning multiple themes. So the web block style will adapt to the specific theme of the application. And finally, the uh, page is the last one to be imported because it might be, it is very specific and it might be, might be very specific for that specific page only. So the end result, as you can see here, is the web block is affected by the theme and by the page and the CSS created by the, in, added in the, in the theme is affected by the page. So this is actually what enables us to create enterprise grade style guides because we are able to isolate these web blocks in a centralized way and use them in multiple applications and in multiple themes. If you want to learn more, more about CSS and how it works in the platform, you can actually learn or see the CSS shop that is present in, our, in the learn section of our website and is chapter four. Moving forward in the head, we have the JavaScript. The JavaScript, just like the CSS, we have JavaScript that comes from the platform and is, it's this three. Then we have the JavaScript that we add in the web blocks or the JavaScript that is added to the patterns or blocks that we are consuming. And finally, we have the page JavaScript. We can also have JavaScript that was injected. Just like the CSS, there are several places where we can add JavaScript. First of all, we have in the module. And this is very uncommon to do, and we will see why. The JavaScript that we add here, it's JavaScript that will be added in every page of the eSpace. And the platform will create a file called underscore OS global JS that will contain all of this JavaScript. Then we can add in the page. And this means just like in the CSS, that this JavaScript will just be present in this page, it will be just running on, on this page. And finally, we have on the web block. This means that every page that is using this web block will run this JavaScript. Now, the order in which the JavaScripts are added in the head is slightly different from the CSS. So the first one to be added and the first one to be imported and run by the browser is actually the CSS of the eSpace of the module. The second one is then the, the JavaScript of the web block. And finally, it's the JavaScript of the page. So if we just do a console log, we can clearly see which one is running first. And we can see that it's the eSpace, then the web block, and finally the page. Moving now to the body, what we can see is that we have several elements that are related uh, with the view state. 
But even before that, something that we, you will notice is that almost all of the HTML in the body is wrapped with a form. And this is a very typical question uh, from front-end developers. It's why is there a form involving all of our uh, HTML? And the reason for this is that our systems, it's a platform, meaning we, can, we do not control what applications and how the developer uh, adds the inputs and adds the buttons. So this enable, uh, enables the platform to be sure that no input is lost and that every, uh, everything is maintained and sent to the server when there is a submission. Then we have also some JavaScript from the platform and that we'll dig into those a little bit later. We have also IPA test box. We will see this, what's this, and actually how we can remove this. We have then our code, and you'll see that if you are using SilkyY, your code will be entirely below uh, the div that has the class page. This enables you to create CSS with the specific classes that are added here. So, quick recap. So, JavaScript and CSS files are automatically added in the head by the platform. The platform organizes the resource in a specific order. So, first, it puts all of the meta tags, meta tags that will be used for responses, for the fav icon, or for creating our, making sure that our application is a mobile web app. Additionally, this meta tags can be added uh, by the developer, as we will see later on. Then we have the CSS files, all of the CSS files that will be used by the application. So CSS from the web box, the theme, and the page. And finally, we have all of the JavaScript files, meaning the, the eSpace, the web box, and the page. Finally, as we were just seeing, all of our code is inside the form to avoid losing, losing information, user information when sending it to the server. So now let's move to the next chapter and we, where we will see some of the top front-end techniques that we can apply to the platform. And starting by the best practices, best practices can be in several layers or in several levels. Can be on the level of CSS, on the JavaScript, and obviously assorted, just like in this. So we'll start with CSS. So the first rule or the first best practice that we'd like to recommend you is to have a code convention. And this will make the difference. So it will enable you to, first of all, you should create and enforce it because it will enable you to control and to make sure that your CSS is accordingly to what you expect. Meaning independently from who is working on the CSS, the end result will be the same, with the same style and the same characteristics. You can see some examples of how you can define your conventions, and I do invite you to do explore this and do check and adapt to your own conventions, but do have some. In the Silky Y example, we also created conventions, our own code conventions, that can be seen as this one, as we can see here on the right side. So, first of all, we only, the first rule is only one rule per line. We are not going to add more than one rule in one line. This will enable the code, the CSS, to be much more easy to read. There should be a space between the property and the value and a, a, a semicolon at the end of the line. This is standard and it's very simple. Once again, it will make sure that the CSS will be valid by default and not only that, it will enable us to have consistency in the code and be easier to maintain because it's easier to read. It's alphabetically ordered. This just simplifies the way uh, in which we add the CSS. And th this also means that whenever we are creating or adding new attributes to a class, we already know where to add them. Whenever possible, just make the animations in CSS. And this is much more than a 
code convention or CSS code convention. This is a best practice in terms of JavaScript, as we'll see later on, and in terms of performant uh, web applications, of performant web applications, yes. Another one would be to keep the indexes values as low as possible, because having high the Z indexes will only contribute to harder to maintain code. Small tip, we will be creating a knowledge base article with the guidelines that we followed when creating SilkUI, so that you can have one more reference to follow or at least to get inspired when creating your own code conventions. Another one is to avoid unnecessary prefixes. So as you know, with CSS3, there are a lot of elements that were that are that were being added along the time, and that the browsers were starting to support, but not all, all of them supported as it was specified. An example of this was, for example, Box Shadow, where Mozilla was supporting in a way, uh, the Chrome was supporting in another way. And the final, the specification was just to be box shadow. So this was very typical for us to create it this way. But not every property from CSS3 needs the vendor prefixes. And this will only contribute for our code to be harder to maintain, harder to read, because you have all of these prefix prefixes just saying and just stating exactly the same. So one of the things that you should do is always go to can I use, can I use com, and check if you can use that specific property in the browser. Another thing that you can uh, actually do is go to should I prefix, where you can look for a specific element and you can see if you need to use a prefix or if it's not required anymore. So if it's not required, don't add it. So in this example, where we have the shadow element, we just needed to have the last line. The other two lines are just uh, noise. So examples of where it's needed and where it's not needed, when using transform, we still need to use it. Animation as well. Flex, for example, is one of the hard ones. So the, a tip here would be do use ultra prefix to, to check what are the prefixes to use, because it actually, in Flex, it actually changed between the browsers, the, the property name. Background with gradient is, is still required, but for example, calc, or even box shadow, box sizing, and transition, they no longer require prefixes. So be aware of that, and do use the tools that I've mentioned to you to make sure that you don't add things that aren't necessary. Regarding the platform itself, you should avoid using ID selectors in CSS, such as this one. Why? First of all, they are automatically generated by the platform, and they do depend on the hierarchy of the elements. So you can have exactly this, where we have uh, an element called main content, and you can see its ID, and one of the childs can, you can see that it has the prefix of its ID, it's the ID of the parent. So do not try to guess, because this might change any time. So the rule here was, would be always use class, classes instead. Do not use ID selectors. However, you should also be aware of the performance of the selectors that you use. And Obviously, an ID selector is faster to use by the browser, it's faster to apply the style uh, in the browser than the class. But nowadays, with tests that we have been doing and that a lot of people in the internet have been doing, the performance of the browsers when dealing with selectors for IDs and classes is becoming more and more similar to the point where if you use an ID or a class, it's about the same thing. Then you have um, the type. When we are trying to, to, to select a given element or to apply a cell to a given element by its type, HTML type. When we are trying to use two, uh, two sim links using the plus symbol and so on. So you should be aware 
of the performance of the different selectors. So that's when you are creating your own CSS, and I know this is quite advanced, but when you are creating, you should be aware of this in order to avoid the ones that are less performant. If you want to learn how to measure the performance, you can actually check the webinar made by uh, Daniel Reis called Troubleshooting Mobile Apps Performance, where he explains the browser tools, Chrome tools, and in teaches, teaches you how to troubleshoot the performance of an application. Another rule is avoid defining CSS in the web blocks and in the pages. Why? First of all, this will lead to style duplication because you'll have a, sim a second page in which you will want to use the style that you are using in the first one, and it's very common for people just to go there and copy past those styles instead of bringing those styles to somewhere common, such as the theme. It will actually make the application harder to maintain and harder to evolve. And finally, as you can see, it will cause an impact in performance due to the number of files that the browser needs to download on the first access. So in this example, and this is fairly common, we have 17 CSS files, 25 JavaScript, 21 images, and four fonts. This will have a huge impact, especially when we are accessing through a mobile device using a non-Wi-Fi network. You can learn some of some performance techniques if you review the, the session that was presented actually by me in Next Step 2015, uh, entitled Delivering Mobile Apps That Perform. When adding CSS to your theme, you should have it organized. And the first rule here is you should create an index for it. Just like what we have in SilkUI, and if you go to SilkUI, you'll see exactly this, you should create the index of your CSS so that it enables you or any developer in the future that needs to change anything or to just check what the, the, the specific style applied to an element, um, to go there and immediately identify where that specific area, area is. Additionally, not only creating the, the index, but you should also divide the CSS itself so that you can just control find for a specific area and just land on the area where that CSS is all. If you are using media queries, a typical rule of thumb is to add them on the end of the file because you want them to override the, the previous rules in order to for, for the responsive behavior. But if you are using, using SilkUI, it's even better in this aspect because you can leave the responsive behavior right next to the pattern. So you have the definition of your specific pattern, and this is a real example. And right next to it, you have the responsive behavior of it. And this will enable you to be, to be, this enables the pattern to be easier to maintain because all every CSS that uh, applies to the pattern is in, a, in the specific area is all together. You should also be aware of the theme dependencies. Whenever we are saying that our theme is based on another theme, we are using we are using an import. What this means is that our theme depends on another theme that on the on the other hand depends on the Lisbon theme, for example, and finally depends on Silky Y. This is the same as saying that these files, and as you know, the browser can download up to six files in parallel. This means that these files will be downloaded sequentially because they are hidden with the import tag. So a tip here is CSS is hinder blocking. Hinder blocking means that the browser needs all of the CSS files in order to hinder the page. So do avoid to use import since it will delay the page render. You should check the tips that were given by Daniel Reyes on the webinar entitled Building a Lifestyle Guide, 
where he mentions how we sh you should merge some CSS files in order to avoid having too many imports in the way. So if you want to see the real impact of an import, uh, of an import in the browser on how it works, it can look something like this. And any message is starting in the beginning. Okay, so the browser then first starts by downloading the HTML, sees all of the CSS files, files start downloading, and then when it starts downloading the JavaScript files and starts in, in reading the CSS files, is when it starts discovering that there are more CSS files. So this, this is the reason why the, 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 the performance is delayed. Now moving forward to some of the best practices in terms of JavaScript. So first of all, you should avoid global variables. Why? Because they are non-locally. So the code that is using is not necessarily close to where the variable is. They do not have, you do not, do not have any access control to them. So that means that any part of your program, any part of your application, can change the value of that variable any moment in time and even corrupt the value of that variable. And in, even in terms of memory allocation, we are allocating that variable to the global scope and we are basically polluting it. So if you really must add a, a global variable, then do it explicitly. Just use window dot your var and this means that this variable is global and it's explicitly global. Another one is avoid console log pollution. So it's very common for us when creating our JavaScript code to add console logs. And in time, we typically tend to forget to remove them. And this will cause later on in the future when we are troubleshooting some situation, um, what we call console log pollution. Danielle has created an article uh, about console debugging tricks where there are several tricks and techniques that we can use that enable us to avoid using console log on our code and to better troubleshoot and debug our code uh, in runtime instead of adding all of the, that code before compile before on the hour space that will cause it to just exist there typically forever. Another one would be to avoid doing animations with JavaScript. And we can see here an example of an animation done with CSS3 and jQuery. As you can see in CSS3, it's very smooth, the parameterization is the same, and in jQuery, you can see that it's much more abrupt. And that is why, that's one of the reasons why you should avoid doing animations in JavaScript. Also, the only way that you have to achieve 60 frames per second is using, is creating animations with CSS, not JavaScript. There is a very interesting article uh, from Jose Rosario called Smooth Head Butter Achieving 60 Frames Per Second Animations with CSS3, where he explains how you can, what CSS you need to apply and what's the best to do when you want to create a fluid animation uh, that runs at 60 frames. Another one is the platform, as you notice, already adds the jQuery. And it has it can work it with two versions of jQuery for now. This means that you should try to avoid including your own version. And this typically happens when you are trying to use a jQuery plugin that requires a more recent version of jQuery. Why? Because the platform will always add the jQuery. And if you are adding one more jQuery, that means that you'll have not only the download time for that specific file, but also the initialization time of the script itself. So do avoid uh, using one more jQuery or more jQuery than 
the, the one that the platform already supports. Another one is do use type and value comparison instead of just value. So this means that JavaScript is a very interesting and tricky language, meaning that you can compare elements with equal equal um, different types of elements that the JavaScript will actually convert the elements to a, a standard one and will compare them. So you can see that on the example below, we can see that a string one is the same to JavaScript as one as a number. Why? Because JavaScript is casting one of the elements and making sure that the both elements are of the same type and then comparing. This is called a value comparison only. A safer comparison is with three equals. This means that we will not only compare the value but also the type of the element. Examples on how this can go wrong is we can see here. If we compare zero to a string using just two equals, well, the return will be true. But if we use with three equals, three equals, that means that we will also compare the type of the value, then it will be false. So it's much safer by default for you to use the three equals when doing when comparing something that than just using two equals. Use object module approach. When you are creating JavaScript, you should avoid trying or creating uh, global functions. And one of the ways to do this is to create objects. And there are several ways, and you can investigate this later on, there are several ways to create objects in JavaScript. One of the ways is this one, where we are defining a variable, a module, and then we are assigning to the module the result of the function. And you can see that that function has several variables inside. Some of them, actually all of them are uh, functions that we can look at, uh, at them as methods. And we can see that we can even have private methods and private variables versus public methods and uh, public um, uh, variables, attributes. So the way to do it, as you can see below, is to return on that action exactly what we want to be public and what we want to be private, we don't return. This will help us to avoid global functions, which is typical, uh, um, a very typical thing to happen in our projects, to have global functions all over the place. And this is a very bad practices, practice. And this also helps us to avoid global variables, since we can define a module with our variables and use access to those variables as if it was an object, uh, the attribute of an object. Finally, you should try to follow common JavaScript practices. You can see them at Doubletree schools or uh, another good example which I like, idiomatic, where they specify not only some of these best practices, but others. Now, going to some of the best practices slightly more assorted regarding the platform, the first one was actually the EPA task box. You probably noticed that when we were um, seeing the body, that on the end of the body, we actually had this this link and this HTML. This happens, and for those who, of you who don't don't know what's the EPA task box, it's that element that shows on the applications that are connected or, or to users that are using PPT. So, our systems platform has a feature called PPT, which is business process technology, and that it enable us to create to mutualize um, a process and to make sure that a specific person is assigned to a specific task and that it will complete and that when performing this task it will be redirected to this screen. So what this means, this feature, is that this feature is 
cross application. It will show up on every application that small balloon on the left that when, when the user clicks can see that big balloon on the right with the specifics of the step where the process is and what it needs actually to do. However, in many of our applications we are not using BPT or in many of our environments and we do not want to have that extra elements to be downloaded by our browser or by our mobile application. So what we can do is to remove and there are several ways to remove. One, one of the ways is to remove programmatically and if you go to, the, uh, to manage dependencies and you have there an EPA task box, you have two actions. One, inbox disable in server and another to enable in server. So this means that this will disable in all applications on our server, the inbox. And sometimes it's exactly what we want. So this means that we just need to add this in a specific layout or you can even add this on a, on a timer that the only thing that it will do is to enable or, enable or disable the inbox for the entire environment. So it, this is very simple to do when we want to completely remove it. When we want to remove just in, in specific applications, there is a back office, which is your environment slash EPA underscore task box, where you can actually select your, your eSpace and you can say or mention you want it, want it not to show up in this specific module, in this specific application. You can learn more in the help of the platform on how to do this and how to uh, overcome the EPA uh, task box. There are more best practices, but some of them, or the majority of them, were already uh, mentioned in the delivering mobile apps that perform session in next step. So I do advise you to take a look again so that you can see some of the best practices or recommendations in order to have applications that perform even with the, in the school behind part, but also on the server configurations and also some platform tips as, if, as in, for example, uh, using the notify mechanism. Moving forward in our topics, we'll now see what is the personal area. So the personal area, has, it is described in the help of the platform. It's an area where the developer can test his changes privately without affecting any other developer. So imagine, imagine it's the same as publishing, but instead of publishing and having to merge with the code of everyone else and everyone else ne needing to merge with your own code later on, you just put it on the server and you can access it and you'll see that it has a specific naming space. So you have your environment, your application, then you have your user. So you have a virtual directory with your user where all of the CSS files, JavaScript and, and HTML are deployed there. So how can you actually achieve this or use this? This feature is slightly hidden. So what you need to do is go to the debugger and it's exactly the first option. Run and debug in the your environment personal area. You just click on F6, it's, that's a shortcut, and it's already, it, it starts publishing your application but to your personal area. There are limitations when using and when you change some of these elements, such as entities, set properties, session variables, timers, roles, or references, you will be uh, obligated to publish the application. Not only to our personal area, but to everyone's, uh, to the public area. Another one that is very useful, another technique, is the ability to change the head. Sometimes we want to add a, a script to the head, or we want to add a specific style sheet to the head, or even the five icon. So how is that we are able to do that? For that, there is an extension called HTTP Request Handler that you can reference, it's a system component, and it has several actions that enable us to add elements to the head. 
So we have we have for example add JavaScript tag or add meta tag or even add style sheet tag. Okay? But the most powerful one is add post processing filter. What this action enables us to do is to using a regular expression to replace something. So what you can do with with this specific method is to remove, for example, a, a given script or to change the script by another one. So it's a very powerful one and however should be used with care. Additionally, this specific method at post process processing filter, it's not implemented in Java. So it only works in .NET. Another hidden jewel uh, of the platform is the include JavaScript underscore API. So this extension, what enables us to do, it's similar or might look similar to what we just uh, heard or spoke about HTTP request handler with the change, with the difference that it enables us to add a script that will be added to every page on a specific group of applications or modules. Okay, so for that, the only thing that you need to do is to create the rules, so add exclusion rules to the modules that you don't want um, this script to be applied to. But other than that, you can add one script, and this script will be added to the platform in every page, in every application. Another very important area when, when talking about front-end techniques is browser support and testing. And with every increasing number of devices, and for example in Android, this is the kind of fragmentation, market fragmentation, which we are looking at. It makes it really, really hard for us to be able to test and to be sure that our application is running as expected and looking as expected in every browser. And even if the, these devices are all Android, there are also different versions of Android. And I'm not sure if you are aware, but before Android 4.4, the web view, meaning the browser, the default browser of the operating system, which is the browser that the majority of people, uh, non-technical or not savvy people, techy savvy, uh, use, uh, that browser is a very old browser. So for example, it doesn't support the majority of CSS3 properties. And that web view, uh, up until Android 4.4, was not updatable. So it was very hard for us to create an application for those devices because it would break as if it was IE6. So the port here that you should have is first when starting a project, you should first try try to identify what are the target devices for the market where you are, uh, where your project will be um, will be used. So there is a very interesting report um, about what the the browsers usage and the browsers um, and the browsers that are used in the in the in the different regions of the world. Uh, with metrics. So you can check and you see what are the browsers that you need to support or that you should be looking at. Not only that, but you should try to test in those tra target browsers slash devices. And one of the ways, if you are not able to test in real devices, which is the preferred way obviously, one of the ways is using software has, has browser stack or cross-browser testing that enable you to um, do a live test on real devices of how your application is looking in the browser. Additionally, these two tools have an API, a REST API, that you can integrate it with the platform and that enable you to request screenshots and to receive the image resulted from that screenshot. Now moving forward to the, to the cooler coolest part, which is let's try to cut corners and to simplify our lives as uh, front-end developers, 
But not only that, let's make sure that we are more proficient and faster uh, as if we were using any other technology. So something that typically happens is we are as front-end developers, and I hope that this is very common, we are working on the browser. We are creating our own styles and making sure that it looks as it expected and so on. And then when we are done on when we are ready, what we'll be doing is to copy those styles to our theme and then publish and wait. So this publish and wait, it annoy, annoys to every one of us that we are creating. Because although it's pretty fast, okay, uh, having consideration what is doing under the hood, it still, it still takes some time. So we had a colleague on our team um, called Mauro Vieira that he was getting mad, crazy, with the time that it was taking for him to just do a change, go back, publish, and go back to the browser and see that it was not exactly what it, he was expecting. So he was getting crazy with all of this. So we invited, or he started to look to some solutions, and we invited him to, to share that solution with the team. So his solution was to use some of the tools of the trade that every front-end developer uses, such as Sublime Text, Google Chrome, Shump, we'll see later on why, Node.js, and some extensions from Chrome, from Chrome uh, namely CSS Injection and Live Reload. So what this enabled him to do was to be working on Sublime Text, and while he was typing and saving the file, the page would automatically load and immediately reflect the change, changes that he was doing. What this means in practical terms is that the, the extension uh, CSS, CSS Inject in Chrome is adding a style sheet. And this style sheet is overriding, since it's added on the end of the head, it's overriding the other changes that that were done in the theme. So this enables you, for example, to bring the entire theme to your file and to start changing it and then to take back to Service Studio with the changes that you did and then you can publish. Do not, do not worry too much because we will be creating a post explaining step by step on how to install and how to do this. Let's go now to a live demo where we will see that live happening. So we have here our application, and you notice that I already have here uh, the extensions. So the first one is this one, so CSS injection, and notice that I went to the configurations, and you can see that I have here uh, the local host, the address to a specific uh, file. So let me just Add this one here, and let me open the file in Sublime Text. Here we go. Okay. So this is the file. So what this means is that CSS injection will be looking to this specific file and will inject this file in our in our page. Okay. So first of all, let's activate it, and also. We have here, we have to enable load and save scripts. Yes, so it will load. And then finally, we have to connect live reload. So now let's see how it works. So I want to change these cards to have a background image. So I'll, I already know the specific styles that I want to, to affect. And then I want to use a background image. And I'm, I have the URL here in my machine. Let's add some border. And finally, some color. So now what I'm going to do is just to save the file. So I'm going to save, 
let's see if everything is connected. And once I save, I immediately see reflected here the changes. So I can go on and see, okay, the text was affected. So I want to put the descriptions. In, in white. Oop, sorry, I will buy someday. And I styles. There we go. And we immediately see the change here. You might be asking, so what's the real difference of doing this between here or doing this in the browser? Well, the difference is that, first of all, this is a local file, so this won't be lost once I, I basically refresh the page. If I refresh the page, notice that it's immediately applied, so I don't lose it. I can even navigate between pages. Okay, That's the first thing. Another one is, I'm not sure if you have ever had the, the problem about doing the, all of the styles and trying to change the CSS and suddenly Chrome crashes. It just crashes, just because it can. And what happens is that you ended up losing everything that you, that you had or just restarting again. So this makes it very simple and very easy. Additionally, if you have here your entire style sheet, so your, your theme, the theme of your application, for example, you can be changing, keeping all of those Service Studio tags for the preview, and then when you are done, you can just copy and pass them to Service Studio and publish as a whole. Getting back and moving now to the part where we will be de defeating the dragon. So a rule of thumb here, whenever you are faced with this kind of question or with this kind of, uh, of fear, it, if, if it can be done with a web technology, then it can be done in our systems. Because the platform is very open and it enables you to integrate with another, other technologies in order to, for you to create your own application. So this means that you are able to integrate anything that you want or that you might need. So if it's doable in the web technology, then it's doable in our systems. As a matter of fact, we created a framework just like you, what you have to uh, Bootstrap and Zurb Foundation and so on. We have created SilkyY based on that. And I do advise you in, and invite you to check the webinar from SilkyY uh, about SilkyY made by uh, Samuel Zuz. So some examples of great UI. You can see, for example, the style guide that we have published in the Forge has an example, not only has an example on how to create style guides, but how uh, a good uh, an application can be looking good in our sensitive platform and still go to Service Studio and be manageable. So we are not talking here about an escaped expressions and so on. We have other applications that have been, been creating uh, by our customers and by our partners that have great UI and great look, and it, it is has any other application out there in the internet, in the web. So the takeaways that you should have from this webinar are front-end is not different in our system that, than it is in any other technology. There are slightly some nuances and some things to have in consideration. For example, the fact that the platform already brings jQuery, that you can work with it and that you can apply exactly the same techniques and approaches that you use in other uh, platforms. You can leverage the platform mechanisms and you should, such as the jQuery, so if it's there and you should, not, you, you try, you should try not to import it and you should try to use it if it's possible. Um, you have HTTP request handler, for example, to change the head. It's there, you can use it. So everything is possible. But obviously, on every platform, with necessary care and with the necessary um, advice. 
So we will now break for three minutes, and after three minutes we'll come back to answer to all of your questions. Please make sure to add them and to ask them in the Q&A or in the chat window in WebEx. We'll be back in a minute then. 